Good morning. This is Kirsten Baumgart-Turner. I am the new host for Sustainable Hawaii, and I'm delighted to have as my first guest McKenna Kaufman, PhD in the Department of Urban and Regional Planning at the University of Hawaii. Her specialty is greenhouse gas emissions, mitigation, not emitting them, <laughs> uh, energy policy and alternative transportation strategies. She holds a BA in International Relations from Stanford University and a PhD in economics from the University of Hawaii. And on, in addition to all this, she's a research fellow with the University of Hawaii Economic Research Organization. I've asked McKenna to come here today in order to talk about greenhouse gas emissions, what they mean for the United States, Hawaii, and the world. And what I want to start the show with each week as I take over this effort to have good engagement and information on sustainability in Hawaii is to be able to introduce a basic sustainability concept each week. So one of the things I'd like McKenna to help me do is introduce the concept of life cycle analysis. Um, we know that it's a method to use that, that's used throughout the industry to be able to um, measure environmental impacts, in particular of different technological processes, but also economic impacts. So can you tell us a little bit about LCA, life cycle cost analysis? And maybe in relation to the petroleum industry, since we're talking about greenhouse gas emissions, and that is the most common emitter that most people are aware of. Sure. Thanks, Kirsten, for having me on the show. Um, it's an honor to be here. And uh, particularly talking about, this, about life cycle analysis and greenhouse gas emissions, it's um, a very timely topic, I think. A lot of policy going on in this, in this regards. And um, I think it's really important to understand what is life cycle analysis in order to understand how do we get to really good policy for greenhouse gas emissions reductions. So life cycle analysis is a way to think cradle to grave about any kind of production process. Um, and <clears throat> not just thinking about um, you know, your use of a product and then you throw it away, but also how is that product made? So Actually, we have a visual that might help people to look through the pathway of production for petroleum. Yeah. Maybe you could walk us through that. Okay, so... Um, we zoom in on that top visual. Great. Yeah, so the idea here is that <clears throat> you, the greenhouse gas emissions that happen from any kind of fossil fuel use aren't just at the end of point combustion. It's not just when they're in a refining process or in your car or um, for oil in Hawaii within the electric sector as well. Uh, but also, a lot of greenhouse gas emissions occur in the production process of extracting um, the fossil fuel, extracting petroleum out of the ground. So there are, for example, machines that are used for extraction. Uh, the, those machines may use diesel uh, fuel, and that has a greenhouse gas emissions component to it. Then the, um, then the petroleum is transported via some kind of ground transportation, so there's a transportation, greenhouse gas emissions. Then it's also refined, right? So there's processing. And within that processing process, you're going to have greenhouse gas emissions associated with that. And then that refined product may then be subject to more transportation till it gets to its point of end use. So in the case of Hawaii, it may be shipped for a very long distance um, in order to get here so that we can use, for example, jet fuel or what have you. So this is the entire um, entire system we want to be thinking about in terms of greenhouse gas emissions, uh, not just what happens when oil is burned in our power plants, for example. Um, and the reason is that they are very different for fuel. Um, so accounting for that really does matter. Okay. Thank you for the visual. Um, one of the things that people don't take into account in life cycle analysis is also the um, disposal of the products. So can you give us a couple examples of how the disposal of different products, particularly petroleum, might have an impact on our air quality and greenhouse gas emissions? Sure. So um, let's take the example of the electric sector, right? So you have petroleum that's imported into Hawaii, uh, refined within our refineries, and then a product goes to the electric sector, and that's what's burned to make the majority of our electricity about 70-some percent at this point. Um, and 
it's that combustion within the electric sector that's generally accounted for as greenhouse gas emissions um, for that sector. Uh, and if we think about the, the sort of suite of environmental concerns, it's not just about greenhouse gas emissions, but also potentially about other air pollutants that are regulated by the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency. So um, we also are looking for what we consider more traditional regional pollutants that might also affect um, health, air quality, things like that. Um, but these are highly regulated under the U.S. Clean Air Act. Before we talk about the Clean Air Act, which I want to get to, one of the things that happens that people aren't aware of in many of these production processes is, for example, land movements, the disruption of soil and runoff and things. How might that get into the air and be part of the regional pollutants? Are you talking about specifically for um, petroleum products or? Actually, in general, for Hawaii, some of the things that we might be ingesting in our air that uh, we don't think about in greenhouse gas emissions. Mm, okay. Well, Hawaii's air quality is really quite good, right? Hallelujah. <laughs> because we have very nice trade winds as well as a lot of regulations uh, for sort of end of pipe treatment for air, air quality regulations. Maybe a good example of this would be um, municipal solid waste. So our landfill issues. Um, if we, <clears throat> much of our landfill on Oahu at least, much of the trash that um, goes to landfill is actually diverted to make electricity. And there's been an effort in the recent years to, in to um, increase this such that almost the majority of uh, waste on Oahu that can be burned is burned. And this is mitigating the need for for new landfill sites to be located, um, which clearly has other environmental and land use impacts. So there is this nice relationship between being able to use this resource um, for a different purpose, kind of repurposing it. And then once again, you, there are environmental uh, impacts related to that in terms of air quality through the burning process, mm -hmm. at which point you need a lot of sort of scrubbers and of pipe treatment um, in order to ensure environmental quality and air quality. Terrific. And some of the other things I think about that, you know, are, are very pertinent to people in Hawaii, and particularly on Maui, because we still have a, a sugar plantation there, and we know that people get upset when there's burning of the sugar cane mm -hmm. in the fields of the bagasse. So how can that affect, is that more of a regional pollutant, or is that part of the greenhouse gas pollution, air pollution that we think about? The primary effect is probably is probably categorized more as a regional pollutant in terms of smoke and any kind of um, ash from that activity. Uh, but there is a greenhouse gas emissions component anytime you're burning a biomass mm -hmm. um, that should be accounted for within this life cycle analysis. So biofuels are a good example of where life cycle analysis is very important to account for because if you take a biofuel that has been processed to a point that it's really, really similar to its fossil fuel counterpart, so like a biodiesel. The um, end of pipe combustion, sort of if you burned it in a power plant, it's very, very similar to normal diesel. However, because it was um, produced using a bio-based, uh, you know, a, a using biomass, there was also uptake of carbon in that process. And so it should be given some credit for the fact that there was, there's this life cycle aspect to it where it's it uptook carbon in sort of the bioproduction, um, and then it gets released in end of pipe treatment, or not in burning within the power plant. Interesting, and one of the things that a lot of people think about is, for example, with biofuel production, that we're burning a cleaner fuel, but on the other hand, we're disturbing the carbon that's in the soil and allowing that to go up. And I'm just wondering what is the comparison between a biofuel um, emission profile or life cycle analysis of, of biofuel production and some of the things we might look at with petroleum and or natural gas. Okay, so biofuels have a really large range of how responsibly they could be produced. Um, sort of uh, the, on the high end of the spectrum, if they're produced really responsibly with things, you know, making sure you're using um, prior agricultural land so you're not degrading new forests, as well as use uh, methods like no-till agriculture if you're, uh, so you're not disturbing that soil carbon, um, then if you do that, you could really have enormous gains in comparison 
to a life cycle analysis of greenhouse gas emissions for safe oil. Um, Terrific. Up to a 75% to 90% improvement over oil. On the other side, it could be you know worse than oil if you, say, denuded a forest in order to create new lands for biofuel production. So um, the practices range really widely, and as a result, um, most biofuel producers, or there are, there are certification processes for biofuel producers in order to show sort of where within that spectrum they fall. Well, that's something I might like to have you touch on after we go for a short break, and we'll be right back with McKenna Kaufman from the University of Hawaii. Aloha, I'm Kili'i Akina, president of the Grassroot Institute and host on Ehana Kako, a weekly program on the Think Tech Hawaii broadcast network. Ehana Kako means let's work together. Think of the sad alternative, let's not work together. Here in Hawaii, with all of our diversity and the richness of the people, it's important for us to come together around issues on the, the basis of what's right, and what's good, and what's going to serve the common good. And that's what we try to do at Ehana Kako. Every week, we interview movers and shakers, people in government, business, and other sectors of society to talk about how to create together a better government, economy, a better world here in Hawaii that can bless the rest of the world. I thank you for your attention to Think Tech Hawaii, and we look forward to seeing you every Monday, 2 to 3 p.m., on the Think Tech Hawaii Broadcast Network. We're Ehana Kako, and we wish you well. Aloha. Hi, we're back with McKenna Kaufman, and we're talking about greenhouse gas emissions, life cycle analysis, and understanding some of the impacts for Hawaii. So we were just discussing the comparison between biofuel um, life cycle analysis and emissions and natural gas and what that means for Hawaii, particularly as the big topic in Hawaii energy is whether or not to introduce more natural gas and, and into our energy mix. So can you comment on some of the issues that we should be thinking about when we look at um, the trade-offs for emissions from an emissions perspective? Sure, I'd be happy to. I think um, most of the conversation about natural gas has been around the economic impacts, and um, you know, the, the environmental impacts are equally important. And one of the things about natural gas that's um, appealing is that it burns very cleanly. And as such, it would help Hawaii to meet its state greenhouse gas emissions law. Um, as well as help Hawaii to meet some of the federal Environmental Protection Agency's uh, rules around mercury and air toxic standards, uh, so-called MATS requirements, which are going into effect in 2017. So there's actually quite a bit of environmental policy that is pushing natural gas forward because most of the policy um, centers around how does this burn, and natural gas does burn very clearly, cleanly. Um, the upstream emissions, however, can be quite large. Um, so while Hawaii could be serving to reduce its greenhouse gas emissions, this is what we would call leakage within the system, that functionally we're pushing our emissions someplace else. So depending on how natural gas was extracted and from where, this is a possibility. Um, what, what are some of the issues with extraction that impact the environment and particularly the issues mm -hmm. that people are looking at with those life cycle analysis impacts? Well, specifically with greenhouse gas emissions, it's primarily about whether there's any kind of methane leakage in the production process, um, any kind of sort of venting of, or flaring, which would uh, dramatically increase the greenhouse gas emissions associated with the upstream production or up upstream extraction process of natural gas. Um, there's also the process of liquefaction and then regasification, and those are both energy intensive and have greenhouse gas emissions associated What exactly there. is liquefaction? Oh, sorry, the process of turning it from a gas to a liquid such that it could be transported, okay. right, which is what Hawaii would need um, to do because we don't, we're not part of a pipeline. Um, and does that happen at both ends? So the liquefaction would happen before it gets on a ship, and uh, once sort of getting to Hawaii, it would need to be regasified in order to use in the power And plants. there's leakage at both of those points? There can be, depending on how it's done. Right. Um, and the other issue is what, what kind of, what source you're going after, sort of conventional versus unconventional shale, natural gas. Um, Let's talk about that for a minute. What is the difference between a conventional oil and an unconventional oil and the extraction, just 
very generally. You don't have to explain the chemical <laughs> technology. Kind of how hard it is to get out, right? Yeah. Is it sort of right at the surface? Or are you digging very, very far to get it? Um, shale sources tend to be quite a bit dirtier. They're deeper down. And as a result, they're harder to get. Um, so it was really only high fossil fuel costs that spurred investment into this, right? High costs being able to support the R&D into this arena. Um, and as a result, it's, it's a more intensive greenhouse gas process because you're having to dig deeper down. So as a result of our increased hunger for more and more energy, the expanding energy use in the world, and particularly in the United States and Hawaii, as we grow to be you know, uh, a burgeoning population, we're demanding more energy. The energy is more expensive, so it validates going deeper and deeper in the ground to find it. In the process, what you're saying is we're using more life cycle inputs, and they have impacts environmentally as well as on our regional air quality and greenhouse gas emissions. Yes, um, as well as potentially water quality is a as a point that you know separate from greenhouse gas emissions. But this is an issue with hydraulic fracturing, which has to do with um, the extraction of either oil or gas with, from unconventional sources. It's a technique used um, to get the sources out. But the conversation is that it ha potentially has a lot of effect on nearshore water resources. For example, New York State has banned the practice of hydraulic fracturing within mm -hmm. the entire state. Um, and it's not because there's, well, there is evidence, but uh, there's growing evidence that this could be a problem. But particularly within the 2005 Federal Energy Policy Act, it was exempt from a lot of our national environmental review laws. So mainly the hard look hasn't been taken, and states would like that to be taken before they impact their water resources potentially very negatively. Um, and also to figure out what are ways to mitigate that impact. So it's a combination of we don't quite know what the impact is, the policies aren't supporting looking at the impact without changes to them currently, and there are maybe mitigations, but we just don't know yet. So this is what you're talking about when we look at natural gas in Hawaii and we push off those impacts to other states. Mm -hmm. Because it's not being mined here, we're not going to have those water impacts, but they're going to exist at the source, source point of the natural gas. Yes. Okay. And we don't really understand what those impacts are fully yet. Um, but that is something that at the federal level is starting to happen um, because states have had so much pushback, like New York. And um, I should say that on a greenhouse gas emissions basis, natural gas, even in a life cycle, tends to be cleaner, definitely cleaner than coal, and it tends to be cleaner than oil. Um, so it is marginally better from a natural gas perspective. However, the accounting is quite off because it burns so cleanly, but most emissions happen upstream. Exactly, and I want to make that really clear because our sustainability principle that we want to discuss today is life cycle analysis and making sure people understand that when we talk about all these technologies, we are actually having to look at every impact along that production pathway that we showed in the beginning that you so nicely explained for the petroleum industry. And so at each stage of production, there's going to be an environmental impact as well as an economic impact on both uh, land, air, and water quality. Um, so within Hawaii, we may not see all of those impacts, but our actions here are going to impact everywhere else, in, in particular the point source for natural gas, mm -hmm. as we know it does for oil as well, since we only refine it. And actually, we're not refining much anymore either. Um, one of the things I want to begin talking about is uh, the Clean Air Act, regional pollutants, and you explain the difference between regional and greenhouse gas pollutants a little more for us? Sure. Uh, I think one of the reasons that greenhouse gas emissions mm -hmm. have been such a policy struggle is that it's, it's a global pollutant. So by emitting um, you know, a ton of CO2 in Hawaii, it doesn't mean that residents of Hawaii are directly going to feel that impact per se. But as, you know, as a globe, the more greenhouse gas emissions within our atmosphere, we're starting to see these really pejorative mm -hmm. environmental effects. What are some um, of those effects? Um, I think the one that's probably 
most sort of well understood and sort of is being addressed through policy in Hawaii is sea level rise, that we would expect um, the oceans to be rising uh, in general as well as more rapidly than, than previous. Can um, you explain briefly why that is? What is the greenhouse gas impact on, what does it have to do with sea level rise? Um, okay, so I'm not a climate scientist, but let me try to explain this as best as possible. But functionally, as water warms, it expands, right? So there's a thermal expansion component. And the second component is also um, melting of the Arctic. So glacial melting would also contribute just simply more water, more volume. Um, there, I've seen climate models that show that the first impact in Hawaii is going to be the thermal expansion. And this is because it'll take a while for the waters to sort of equilibrate throughout the world in terms of the total volume. And so um, we should be experiencing more rapid sea level rise. The um, projections from scientists that I've seen roughly gen generally plan around one meter by the year 2100, um, and which is a tremendous amount um, right. to deal with. And so issues of persistent flooding are going to occur. Um, I think I don't know if Jay has put this on the show before, but we've see, all seen the slide that puts Waikiki well underwater by 2030, I believe. Mm -hmm. So that would be the if, work. If we I, stay I, on that trajectory. And probably the work from um, Chip Fletcher and the Coastal Geology Group at UH. And yes, so you know, uh, Dr. Fletcher has uh, been doing really wonderful work modeling the Honolulu area, including Waikiki, and it shows just you know, not that it's going to be underwater constantly, right. but that at some times we're going to be experiencing tremendous amounts of flooding, and it's going to, you know, really challenge our sewer systems. A um, lot of planning issues associated with how do we adapt to this. So this is a really important concept for people to understand that greenhouse gas emissions have an impact on uh, water warming. Water warms and expands and contributes to sea level rise. Mm -hmm. That's not something I think all of us intuitively get. And you've just explained it very well. Thank you. Um, another impact I want to point out, because I think it's one that's way off the radar, but probably will impact us in some ways the most, uh, potentially because there are fewer ways to engineer our way, our way out of it, is um, ocean acidification. So the absorption of carbon with, within our waters, which is where most carbon gets absorbed, means that it will become more acidic, and which will also mean that ocean life won't be able to um, live there as we expect and know now. Um, particularly, coral reefs are going to die in tremendous, in tremendous cliff. And we and know that we're already experiencing that in Hawaii. It's one of the most devastating things that we, who have lived here for a long time, have noticed the, the reduction in our fisheries um, and our reefs. And with that very sad note, I'm going to take another break, and we'll be right back with McKenna Kaufman. Thank you. Aloha, welcome to Think Tech Hawaii. My name is Josh Green. I'm the host of a program called Healthcare in Hawaii. I'm a physician. I work in the emergency department on the Big Island. I also serve in the state senate, which please don't hold that against me, doesn't detract from my television program. We speak about all the big healthcare issues in the state. We get together on Tuesdays from 2 o'clock till 3 o'clock in the afternoon. And we try to talk about the most important issues in healthcare. This is a terrific venue for people to learn about healthcare. There are many programs on this on this station. We broadcast it later, uh, not just on the internet, but also on OC16. Thanks for joining us. Please be informed healthcare consumers. Hi, we're back with McKenna Kaufman. We're having a very good discussion on greenhouse gas emissions. Um, it's not just hot air, but it has lots of other <laughs> impacts, particularly on our warming oceans and sea level rise. We know that, that scientists and policymakers were beginning to understand these issues when they instituted the Clean Air Act, and I can't remember the year. Um, Sometimes in the 70s. In the 70s. 70s. Okay. Early 70s. And uh, for a long time, we haven't had a lot of policy implementation or roadmaps to support that. Can you talk a little okay. bit about the Clean Air Act and its evolution and to, I want to get to discussion of President Obama's power plan. Sure. So the Clean Air Act was, um, it was designed to regulate what kind of more traditional pollutants associated with, for example, power plants, right? That you would, if you have a coal burning power plant, then you have air quality, regional air quality issues. Um, and it's a, it was a mechanism uh, that the federal, 
government rolled out in order to permit and to force sort of any, any kind of end of pipe treatment scrubbers, things that would clean up um, that pollutant and make it so nearby communities would not be so impacted. Um, and that's, you know, that was its primary purpose. It's really about health and well-being mm -hmm. of, um, of residents, citizens in the U.S. Um, in 2007, there was a monumental court case, Massachusetts versus the EPA, in which the Supreme Court... And the Court, EPA being the Environmental, environmental Protection, Protection Agency. Agency. It's a federal environmental protection agency, uh, where the Supreme Court ruled that greenhouse gas emissions, uh, by increasing greenhouse gas emissions, that is a threat to human health, and as a result, falls under the Clean Air Act. Um, so this is important because greenhouse gas emissions aren't sort of a direct pollutant, like, um, like you know, SO2 or NOx and SOx kind of things, but rather indirectly affect human health through some of the mechanisms we were discussing earlier. Um, and as a result, this has given authority to the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency to regulate greenhouse gas emissions and authority that they acted upon last week. So, this so 2007, they realized the importance and included it under the Clean Air Act. And in 2015, we're now having the president's power plan that's actually going to enact some of the regulations. Yes. So there was a long time in between. Um, There's a you know, difference between sort of a Supreme Court ruling versus um, in President Obama's second term really making greenhouse gas emissions mitigation a, you know, a, a priority within. And why do you think that is suddenly on the table? Um, within uh, President Obama's uh, original campaign, his first campaign for presidency, uh, greenhouse, climate change was hugely forefront within his campaign. He had incredibly aggressive greenhouse gas emissions reduction targets that he campaigned on. Um, for example, 80% below 1990 levels by the year 2050, I believe, was his, was his major campaign goal. Um, so there were very sort of lofty goals that were in line with the scientific arguments for what we have to contain greenhouse gas emissions um, to and what would be the U.S. contribution. But when he became president, he really wanted to do this through a mechanism of Congress. And the reasons are because if you can put toward could put forth a carbon tax or a cap and trade program for greenhouse gas emissions, it's likely to be more one sort of an umbrella policy that would attack more sectors at once, as well as economically efficient, which means that people from an economic perspective wouldn't be as impacted. However, that failed to happen. There were a number of um, attempts. The one that went furthest was the American Clean Energy and Security Act, which passed through the House and died in the Senate in 2009 and that would have established a nationwide cap and trade program. Um, so anyhow, he, it was something that really went off the table then. And in his second term, he said, well, I'm going to use the authority that was given in the Clean Air Act via the um, Supreme Court ruling to do this. I don't really need an act of Congress. Um, so the US Environmental Protection Agency has been working the last several years um, to develop, to work with states to develop plans for greenhouse gas mitigations within their existing power plants. This is all for stationary sources, so mainly the electric sector, so not transportation, is what I want to say, um, to create um, goals for reductions within their existing power plants, as well as standards for new power plants. And what this functionally does, the final rules were released last week, and what this functionally does is um, this is the final rules under the president's clean power plan. Yes. Um, there will be no new coal power plants within the U.S. Um, as a result of this. So that's huge. And so that will guide policy to create new sources of power production and hence back to our discussion <laughs> of natural gas and, and other uh, non-traditional sources of fuel burning, or do you think there will be more emphasis on renewable sources? Uh, there will be more emphasis on renewable sources than there has been in the U.S. as an aggregate. There, of course, Hawaii, this is an area in which Hawaii is much above the curve, right? But in the aggregate, there will definitely be um, a slight pivot towards renewable energy and a big pivot towards natural gas, actually. Within the rules, natural gas is favored 
um, and coal is really, the, the, the threshold for coal to meet um, is very, very difficult, whereas it's very easy for natural gas to do so because, it's, because it burns cleanly, right? And they're really looking at this from a... Um, Greenhouse gas emission perspective? Yes, but not upstream, uh -huh. right? Just how it burns. How it burns. So this would be an area which I'd say the policy could improve. <laughs> But natural gas, even from a life cycle perspective, uh, for greenhouse gas emissions is tremendously better than coal. So that is an improvement for sure. One of the concepts that you mentioned that I would like to clarify a little more for our audience is to talk about um, what are some of the carbon tax uh, initiatives and the idea of cap and trade. And can you talk to us a little bit more about that so we have a better understanding? Um, so the idea here is that because greenhouse gas emissions are embodied in so many things, like so many sectors, transportation, electricity, that rather than going through, much like the Clean Power Plan does and set particular thresholds particular, um, for particular power plants or sectors, but rather to say what is the true cost of carbon and how do we price this um, such that we have a, basically create a market for this environmental pollutant. And if we have a market for it, then we can regulate that market and over time reduce it. So the mechanisms would be, for example, a carbon tax, at which point you would you know, levy a tax per ton of carbon um, attached to any activity. And maybe you have to ramp that up over time in order to meet some of your um, greenhouse gas emissions reduction goals. Uh, the opposite being, or the other, other side of it is a cap and trade program. Um, it can look a lot like a tax if you auction off permits. The idea of a cap and trade program is you set the physical threshold for greenhouse gas emissions and then you allocate permits such that it meets that threshold and maybe over time you start ramping down the number of permits that are floating out there, particularly as technology gets better, as renewable energy sources develops and things like that. And we know that some states have cap and trade and have some carbon taxes. Um, what do you think is the likelihood that Hawaii will ever have this? Um, that's a good question. So we do have a, a, you know, a barrel tax. It's a fairly low amount. Um, and the barrel tax being a tax on the import per barrel of oil. Yes. Uh, my understanding is this has been extended. It uh, has been translated to a kind of a unit of energy aspect, and it could be extended to any imported natural gas in the future um, and to the existing coal-fired power plant, although coal currently has an exemption. Okay. One of the things that um, you have been involved with from the get-go, um, because I remember sitting in on all of these early meetings and planning for the Greenhouse uh, Gas Task Force, Mitigation Task Force for Hawaii, um, and I know that you're still very involved, so can you tell us a little bit about what that is and what is your role? Um, sure. Uh, there were, in 2007, Hawaii passed Act 234, which made Hawaii um, commit to reducing greenhouse gas emissions to 1990 levels by the year 2020. And um, what are the 1990 levels? Oh, I can't recite off the top of my head the actual levels of greenhouse gas emissions. Is it but, 350 parts per million? Is that? Oh, no, no. Um, so that's okay. 350 parts per million. That comes from sort of what climate scientists um, have put out as a a relatively safe number that we really need to ascribe to in terms of global concentration of greenhouse gas emissions. So 350 parts per million is a global concentration unit. Um, and just to sort of say the magnitude of reductions we really need to achieve is we recently, we passed 400 parts per million a couple of years ago. So we need, in order to avoid the worst impacts of warming, and there would still be a little bit of warming impacts with the 350, or quite a bit actually, but in order to avoid catastrophic warming, is the language often used, then we need to get back to 350 and get back there as fast as possible. Um, so this is one of the things driving some sort of the global conversation. And along those lines, I'd like to say that um, I do think the global, I have a lot of hope about the, about the meeting. There's an annual meeting called the Conference of Parties uh, where global leaders talk about how do we collectively reduce greenhouse gas emissions. and. Um, this is why the number 1990 actually keeps coming up, is because that was part that was the baseline used within the first real agreement called the Kyoto Protocol. And this year in December, the meeting is going to be in Paris. And I think myself and a lot of people have high hopes for this meeting um, because last year 
President Obama, so the U.S. and China were able to have an agreement. Um, and so the U.S. committed to reducing its greenhouse gas emissions by 20-some percent by the year 2025, um, of which the Clean Power Plan that was announced last week is a huge step towards that. So the Clean Power Plan is estimated to reduce electric sector greenhouse gas emissions by 30 percent by the year 2030. I know these targets are all <laughs> a little, okay. um, but they, they do you know, functionally line up in the Clean Power Plan, a very huge step to the U.S. making good on its agreement with China. And the U.S. and China um, reaching an agreement last November is just wildly important for the global negotiations because we are the two largest emitters. Um, How about in Hawaii? How are we doing with our greenhouse gas emissions? Okay. And tell me a little more about what the task force is doing. So Hawaii was, uh, the law is to get down to 1990 levels by the year 2020. And the task force has sort of since been disbanded, so we're not doing anything now. Mm -hmm. But um, in 2008, this task force was put together to talk about how do we develop a work plan to achieve this. I don't think we actually achieved our mission. I don't think we really did come up with a very functional work plan. Uh, there was a lot of learning that, ha that happened within the task force process, um, a lot of divergent viewpoints and the best way to get there. And f eventually we sort of passed this off to the rulemaking process with, I don't think, a lot of guidance. However, there was a majority support to pass a carbon tax within the state, um, though that never really happened. What do you think it's going to take in order to implement some of these um, agreements that did take place, and particularly the carbon tax? Well, I mean, Hawaii does have tremendously aggressive goals for renewable energy within the electric sector, 100% by the year 2045. So we're really leading the charge from that perspective. Um, and there are, of course, greenhouse gas benefits to be had within that transition. Um, we have a tremendous amount of rooftop solar. Um, we have a number of wind projects that have gone, uh, gone within well, for example, this island has 100 megawatts of wind now that didn't exist just five years ago. And, you know, there's costs and benefits and trade-offs and whether people really want that in their backyard is a big question. So as we progress with more and more renewable energy, we're actually going to be moving closer to that 1990 target by removing the pollutant sources? Absolutely. Um, do we have an actual baseline of greenhouse gases in Hawaii? So. One of the things we really did work on as a, as a task force is we worked with a consultant to understand what is our greenhouse gas emissions profile, and we did a baselining for the year 1990 as well as for the year 2007, because we were working in the year 2008. Okay. So we, we did an economy-wide emissions um, baselining for those two years, so we do have some sense of it. Interestingly, one of the things, um, well, one of the, I think the first thing that we really learned from that that I took away was that Hawaii was, is very much in line with the national average. Uh -huh. I think prior to doing that, myself and other people had this notion of because we right. don't have mm -hmm. central heating, we must be cleaner. Um, so and what would you ask, excuse me, as we're wrapping up, our mm -hmm. audience, members of the Hawaii community, to do in order to help us move ahead and away from that national average <laughs> so that we can make progress towards that 1990 goal. Would you look at our camera and let our people know what you think should be done? That's a great question. I think one of the things I'd say is um, sim you know, a simple act is just to do an audit of your house in terms of your energy usage. Go through and think about what are your plug loads. Do these things, these things have to be plugged in all the time? I think something that not many people realize is that, say your cell phone charger, if you have that plugged into the wall, and then you don't have that plugged into your cell phone, it's kind of like having an open faucet. Um, it's very wasteful. Um, so, you know, getting into the habits of taking things out when you're not using it, a uh, simple solution to that can be putting everything on power strips, since that way you just press that button, right? If you're you not- Turn it off. Turn it off. So, uh, you know, part of turning off all your lights before you go to bed would also be turning off all your power strips so that not all those little clocks and other things that you don't need on are, are on all the time. Um, this Why? really does help, and it adds up. Wise advice from a very wise woman who I'm very proud to have known for years, and I really appreciate all the work you're doing for Hawaii. Thank you, McKenna, for joining us. Thanks for having me. Aloha.
Aloha, everyone.